see our screen presentation effectively? Yes, we see it. Okay, very good. So, uh, yeah, so I'm Jason and uh, I have been working in Vietnam since 2006 uh, in collaboration with friends at Kanto University. Uh, have worked there on a range of different basically soil related projects. Um, but firstly, with ACR there on a rice shrimp project, looking at sustainability of the rice shrimp system. Uh, and then that led on to what we call the focus project, which is farmer options for crops under saline conditions. Uh, and with me, uh, I have uh, Brooke, who, who is postdoc on that project. So. Hi, everyone. I also have worked in Vietnam for a while, but started in 2015 as part of my undergraduate and I have progressed through after getting my PhD and now work full time on this focus project and um, interested in soil plant sort of microbial interactions. So it's a great, great space to explore this. Right, yeah. So uh, yeah, the project is funded by ACR and uh, and uh, it's led in Australia by us at Charles State University and our um, in-country lead is um, Kanto University. So um, just as a brief intro, of course, the Delta in Vietnam is hugely important to the country. Uh, it's about 12% of the area, um, a very flat area. And so uh, it is all pretty much less than four metres above sea level, except for a few hills or what the locals call mountains. Um, but yeah, so a lot of it's a lot of it's even less than two metres above sea level. Agriculture is hugely important to the economy in in the delta, um, with eighty percent uh, of the of the jobs um, associated with agriculture in some way. And the Delta produces over 50% of the country's rice um, production, and a lot of that is exported as well. So the economic value is, is quite large. So um, the food, food, bowl, food bowl of Vietnam is the Delta. However, um, over the recent years, there's been competition for the water that's coming down through the Mekong River. So with upstream water use uh, and damming, We've had, due to climate change, uh, drought is a lot more uh, regular now, and even the rainfall patterns have been disrupted. So, so 10 years ago, the dry and wet season were very set, whereas now they're, they're quite variable and unpredictable, um, which causes problems, of course, to the farming, the cropping systems. Sea level rise is an issue, um, being close to the equator, and, uh, and so, the seawater rise has been recorded as being about 12 to 14 millimetres per year. And of course, as the seawater rises, the salt water starts coming up through the canal and river system. And so um, in this diagram in the map here, you can see that there's lines that show the extent of um, salinity coming through um, into the delta inland, up, upstream, up canals. Uh, and salinizing the land. And so you can kind of see there in 2010, you know, you, and it's around the coastal areas or pericoastal areas, 2016 was a, a rather large drought uh, effect uh, and salinity really started to impact uh, rice crops and farmers were, were in a lot of trouble because they, they never experienced this before in some areas because it had moved so far inland. And you can see there in 2020, it happened again and even further in some areas. And so you literally have a situation where people who have been able to farm a certain way for decades, all of a sudden uh, were starting to be impacted by this seawater rise and the saltwater intrusion coming up the canal system. And of course their response once that happened was, okay, I can't irrigate from the river anymore because it's saline, so I'll groundwater pump instead. And of course, removing water from a delta system uh, makes the land subsidence worse. And so whilst the seawater rise is that 12 to 14 millimetres per year, land subsidence is around 40 millimetres per year. And so uh, the net effect of that, of course, is around 50 mils a year, millimetres a year in a system where you are two metres above sea level. So that's like, that's pretty, that's a bad situation. Uh, and that's the situation that we're working in. And of course, the problem is that um, 
that salinity and the, the effect of the drought, uh, basically you have hundreds of thousands of hectares impacted by, by salt and by lack of water, and you have all that loss of production, uh, loss of farm, farm income, and impact on communities, rural communities. So that's our problem. And of course, this the worst of this situation, the, the worst of the saltwater intrusion and the drought uh, occurs in the dry season. So in, in a lot of the areas through the Delta, they'll grow three crops of rice a year. And, and our problem is largely in this early dry season uh, situation. And so uh, it's this third rice crop that gets often will get killed by the salinity. But even in areas where they grow two rice crops, they stretch that out such that that second rice crop is still susceptible uh, in some years to, to impacts by salt. So our what we're looking at is alternatives to rice in this dry season period. Uh, and the, the farmers that, that we work with and the, the DARD, so the Department of Agricultural and Rural Development, uh, government agencies that we work with, they all say you can teach us to grow new crops, we can use new soil techniques, uh, but the, the crop has to be valuable. We have to, it has to have a stronger market value than rice because we can grow more rice and the farmers will still be poor. So the alternative has to be, has to be a marketable, profitable crop. And so we, we focus on that as well. So in looking at these alternative crops, um, we look at the crop, but also the soil management and the agri agricultural management of the field to, to be able to grow those crops. So we've kind of got the biophysical, the, the, the crop, the, the selection of the crop species and also variety, and then the soil management that supports that, that, that crop. And that sort of thing, Brooke will go into more detail, but we're talking about raised beds to minimise the effects of, of water logging mulches to um, minimise evaporation and decrease the effects of salinity, for example. Uh, and then, of course, there's nutrition on top of that. Uh, we are looking at the socioeconomic value chain sort of market analysis. So, you know, if we grow these crops, is there a market for them? What are those markets? What are the barriers to adoption of those crops within the supply chain? Uh, so we, we're examining those within the project. We need to have a really good understanding of how salinity of the soil and the waterways changes through time and space. And so uh, if you look through the literature and online, you'll see maps of the delta that change that show salinity, but often they're created by monitoring points in the waterways and not actually measuring salt in soil or salinity in soil. And so we're looking at doing that um, you know, by a range of different mechanisms. And so we have a, a, a team of people who actually measure salinity in soil and also the waterways, but we also are doing it with remote sensing as well because we have a really strong um, GIS team that's uh, capable of doing that sort of stuff for us. And so the, the value of doing that is we, we, we can understand what can we grow, where can we grow it and under what conditions. And then with that spatial temporal mapping, we actually can match up where you're going to get a large enough scale of land to support those new crops to maybe then inform government to say, look, you can support private industry here or change policy to, to create incentives for businesses to come in and, and fill this niche part of the supply chain to enable uh, uptake of this alternative crop and give it a value. Um, and then the fourth part is we're looking at um, the role of gender in the whole process from uh, knowledge creation in the research team through to the extension to growers, the uptake on farm and also within supply chains as well. Um, understanding that it's a really rapidly moving space and, um, and often that impacts genders differently. And so we need to just understand um, what we're dealing with there and, and how can we um, help offset some of the changes that are going to be occurring. So for the purpose of this presentation, we'll focus on the biophysical aspect of the project. And that comes down to looking at alternative crops to rice to suit this dry season period. So when we first started out, we had to make a criteria that we could um, identify crops that could be suitable. Uh, to start with, it was saline tolerant crops. So obviously towards the end of the dry season, 
the saline intrusion is is really gets quite high and soil salinization is the worst during that later reproductive phase so salt tolerant crops that can grow and reproduce and then create a profitable yield was the criteria we looked at water use efficient crops or crops that used lower amounts of water to complete their life cycle was something that was really important you can get crops that are salt tolerant but use a lot of water and in a system where there's freshwater scarcity it's just not suitable um, there's a risk there's a high risk of failure we also needed crops that could fit the climate of the mekong delta in that dry season the temperatures can get to 35 degrees we get these variable uh, very low rainfall patterns you're relying on irrigation so these sort of crops that fit there, not, not a crop that's a, a cold tolerant sort of crop. They had to be able to work in with the available labour that exists in these smallholder farms. There are some crops that um, can fit both the salt tolerant and water use efficient criteria, but require great amounts of manual labour, and that just doesn't work in the system. So finding something that we can adapt with the available mechanisation and tools available to farmers. And most of all, as, as Jason said, it had to be something that is profitable at the end of the day for the farmers because they need a yield to sell at market. Um, otherwise, there's, there's no point in, in investing in this. So we sort of based um, uh, our crop selection off these criteria came up with a few different um, species to test and understanding that this there's a, there will always be more species, we can't test them all, but we can look at um, the adoption protocols and practices of how that occurs. So we um, did a range of glasshouse and greenhouse trials, both in Australia and Vietnam, and these helped us sort of work out um, the salinity and drought or water use screening of different species, as well as once we identified species, the varieties available in Vietnam that could be best suited to those perhaps different um, spatial areas. There may be areas that are saline affected but has lots of water, and there are varieties that suit that. Alternatively, there are areas of the delta that have um, less saline intrusion but water is an issue so you sort of suit varieties to those areas we also um, yes did water use efficiency sort of screening and through all of those we did things like measuring plant and soil parameters um, lots of different leaf indexes prolines yields biomasses roots nodules all those sorts of things from here, the range of trials that we did, it helped us establish what we could use in the field. And so some of the crops we've trialled, um, cowpea as a legume, beetroot, watermelon, maize, quinoa, we've, we've done a range of different crops and we utilise the information from the glasshouse and greenhouse trials and um, to work out where they are best suited in the delta. We have trials across, uh, it's a transect across the delta, starting in Sok Trang, which is quite close to the coast where saline intrusion is the worst, all the way up to Ang Yang, where it's a broader scale cropping systems. Freshwater scarcity is more of an issue rather than saline intrusion. So there's an adoption of um, different species there. We have these dry season trials and then it goes back into rice cropping after we're finished and we are looking at both the performance of our alternative species and then things like the impacts of that on rice uh, afterwards, as well as, you know, different varieties where they suit, where they're best located. So with those field trials, we've got the species that we've selected but we've also looked at um, different management practices that we can use to enhance the and optimise the growth of these alternative crops. The, we use a, a soil monitoring moisture device called Chameleon Soil Moisture Sensors, 
and these are Australian made, and I'll go into detail in the next slide, but we help farmers understand irrigation schedules. Um, they're familiar with growing rice, which is obviously flood irrigation. These upland crops, uh, different water requirements, we can um, make more efficient water decisions. And so we're using these tools to test those thresholds there. Uh, rice, rice straw mulching, um, different mulching trials. We're doing rate trials, combinations with things like compost and biochar, um, chameleon, so monitoring irrigation with mulch. So it's just integrating these different management practices in things like raised beds, as you can see in one of the pictures up the top there. So chameleons are... Um, a pretty cool device. They are developed um, originally by CSIRO in Australia, and now they're sold through the Virtual Irrigation Company Academy, which is a non-for-profit organisation. They measure soil moisture through soil tension. And the beauty about this is rather than interpreting um, uh, something that could be complex to a farmer is in a reading in kilopascals. It comes up with a traffic light system to indicate the level of soil moisture that's there. And this makes it really easy to use. It provides real-time data back to the farmer and it's relatively cheap compared to things like tensiometers. Uh, they are, however, limited by um, quite high levels of salinity and we're working to see where those sort of thresholds exist and how they fit in with our system. So the traffic light system, just very quickly, blue is, um, it's been calibrated to mean you've got a soil tension between zero and minus 22 kilopascals. So your soil is essentially wet. You don't need to irrigate it. Green is moist. And once a farmer sees the red lights come up, they know they have to irrigate. You can have a, um, multiple different layers. So that each light corresponds to its own sensor and that sensor can be put at different depths. So you could have zero to five, five to 10, 10 to 15 centimetres, or we use them spatially because we've got shallow rooted species. We might use them between treatments um, to determine what irrigation is happening there. So it's a, it's a really useful tool for farmer engagement and as an educational tool, but also a research tool for us. So um, there is a, a chameleon card version, which is a cheaper um, method of it, but it doesn't log data like the Wi-Fi one does. So you can see a farmer here um, in Vietnam, I think the video will play, the lights flashing. So. He attaches the wire and then it will indicate, I think, a green light there. So hopefully he doesn't go and irrigate that crop. But, um, yeah, super, super easy to use. So that's what we're sort of um, utilising in our field trials. Yeah, and, and without without that intervention, the, the farmer behaviour that's been observed is they irrigate every day because they think they have to and they've got no other information to say that they that's not a good idea but we've used the chameleons to show, to demonstrate that actually you, you don't need to irrigate every day. Yeah. So when, um, this is just an example of sort of a field trial experiment we've got set up and we have what we would call the farmer practice, which is that irrigating every day or whatever they perceive as their ideal irrigation. And, and what we've found is it is follows something along the lines of what they would do with rice and then we compare that to our treatments of um, a chameleon with no straw and then various rates of straw mulch to see what water savings we can get. And it's been, um, we've done this over a few years now and the results are really consistent and exciting. We have found, and so um, we'll report uh, beetroot or red beets, whatever you, you'd like to call it. Um, this is just some from a recent trial that we did. And along the y-axis, you can see the water applied. So that's how much water over the growing season that um, this trial used. And we used farmers in this. So we're engaging the farmers in the field trials and getting sort of buy-in there. 
we can see your first column is a chameleon with no mulch. And um, so that was, you know, you're, you're irrigating based off what the chameleon says, but you don't have any mulch. The next one is the same. It's chameleon, but you've got seven tonnes of rice straw there. And that's then compared to a farmer's irrigation with 10 tonnes of mulch. So more mulch than the chameleon one. Yeah, so our, our seven tonne was something that we came up with with mm -hmm. our experiments sort of demonstrated that seven tonnes was the optimal optimal rate for rice, uh, rice straw mulch, uh, whereas the farmers were doing 10 tonne as their standard practice. So that's why that, that's yeah. why that rate is different. Bit of a comparison. We're trying to also show there's efficiencies, hopefully through less labour and straw and use like that. And this was this was really cool because we had, here's our beetroot yield in tonnes per hectare, and you can see um, mulching makes a huge difference. So chameleon, no mulch, it's significantly less yield. But the chameleon with seven tonnes per hectare and then the farmer irrigation with 10 tonnes, there was no yield difference. So the take-home message is that you can use less water and less straw if you use a chameleon and you get the same yield. And we've had this um, not just across with beetroot, we've had it with maize, watermelon. We're extending that now into, you know, cowpea and quinoa. So it's exciting to show the farmers these benefits. They don't have to water every day. You don't have to put on as much straw, but you still get, you know, the same yields that you would if you used that much water and that much mulch. So so this is, this is really, um, it's just a feel-good moment when you see this data. So what we know from, from where we are at this point in the project is that we have found um, alternative crops work. And as I mentioned before, you know, people approach us all the time with different crops, you know, have you tried this, have you tried that? We're not there to find um, the one crop that will save everything. It's the principle of how we implement and adopt new crops and the criteria that we need to focus on and how we can work that into a system that's been predominantly rice-based for, for many, many years. So we've grown these crops, um, novel crops, in areas that have not seen alternative crops and they work, which is good to and, know. And they're profitable. Profitable, yeah, yeah, beetroot. I don't have the quote here, but we interviewed this farmer in the picture and he made, I think, 27 million dong per um, thousand meter squared compared to rice, which was two or 3,000. So significant increases in farm um, income, which is fantastic. And and I think the next point, um, you get that water saving if you combine some management practices to help optimise those crops. There will be, um, there's many other things that you can do, but these are two uh, achievable and accessible tools for farmers. They have rice straw. Chameleons are relatively cheap. We're looking at ways we can, you know, um, get more of these tools out to farmers or, or increase awareness of irrigation. The seven tonne mulch seems to be the magic number um, consistently throughout our trials, 10 tonnes. Uh, it either, you know, it doesn't improve yield or improve anything. So that's a good threshold to know and we sort of work from from that now um it's better than two and a half tons but but seven tons is no better than 10 so that's that's um useful to know and we have found that 25 percent saving in labor and that would be um through irrigation like not having to irrigate daily um you can get that back to a household and we have interviews where farmers have said that they now have more time to take their grandchildren to school and things like that. So there's social benefits as well, as well as 25% um, savings in fuel, and that's from running pumps and things like that. So there are all these sort of other benefits to the alternative crops and the management practices that we're looking at. However, there are still, of course, things that we still need to know and, and need to find these out, and these are research questions um, of interest, timing being a big one. So the um, 
finding those sewing windows where we avoid abiotic stresses like temperature, the saline intrusion, those sort of water limitations. They they are really important in to fit in with a cropping calendar that of rice that's already there. No, and that's a really big challenge because um because one of the effects of the climate change is the unpredictable weather. Yeah. So in our in our journey working there over the last few years, we've had the early storm events that have flooded sites and we've had the the heat wave effects that you know kill seedlings whereas you know the year before that didn't happen and so um and when you talk to the farmers has it been this hot before and they've never seen it this hot before so things are changing and so um that unpredictability is a real issue for us trying to fit these new crops into into the system yeah and then as Jason said, it's fitting them into the system and then fitting them into their cultural practices. So uh, Vietnam has a big holiday in, the, in, in um, our new year, but it's it's Tet. And when you speak to farmers or, or researchers, they say no one will grow crops over that period because they require irrigation daily and everyone takes two weeks off or 10 days. So it's working out, it's, you know, we might have the scientific answer, but it's how that fits into a socio sort of um, family household dynamic practice and, and the implications of changing something like that. Um, we have to sort of look into that as well. And then um, on top of that, it's then optimising once we've sort of got the timing right and it fits into a cycle that works for the farmers, how can we optimise those um, plants, alternative crops? Is it fertiliser? Is it, you know, are we looking at soil constraints? Those sorts of things. Um, the soil is has been growing rice for many years. There's probably um, micronutrient research, macronutrient. There's, there's a whole gamut of optimisation that could go into that to further um, in a way that's low input and, and high productivity, high profitability for farmers. Um, those are the sort of questions that we're looking at in the future. And of course, th those alternative crops, if they have benefit to the subsequent rice crop, that means that you can wind back the fertiliser inputs, then you change the risk profile because now you don't have so much capital invested in, in fertiliser, for example. And so the, the, you know, if the crop fails, the losses aren't as great. So there's those sort of things to take account of as well. Yeah. So with that, that's um, a nice little wrap up of our project and our um, team and fantastic team members in Vietnam who really do a great job of pulling all these field trials and research questions together for us. So it's it's a great place to work and explore these um, these big big picture questions. Thanks for the opportunity to present. Thank you very, very much uh, for this wonderful presentation. I enjoyed it a lot and have a few questions myself, but I will <clears throat> give the floor first to others. Questions, please. Also, comments are welcome. Suggestions and Stefan is first. Yeah, no, uh, great presentation and a lot of learning for us in the Asia Mega Delta Initiative. So linking up is really, really useful, valuable, and hope we can do this further going forward together. Uh, that's just one comment, but uh, my question uh, is a little bit around the choices that you made that the initial crops that you tested did you do some sort of market analysis before? Because uh, you sort of didn't talk about that, that's fine. But just to know, did you do a market? If there's beetroot uh, market out there, there's a potential there or for the melon or whatever it may be, quinoa, et cetera. Over? Yes, yeah. So we, we, we did in as far as we knew that we couldn't do every single crop. And so we grouped them into sort of, you know, cereal types to, or grain crops, vegetables, and did it that way. Um, uh, but um, what's what's what I've learned out of that process is that the scale of operation matters a lot, and so there are some small small farms 
where perhaps some more labor intensive niche uh, like beetroot or something like that, which they can sell locally at a, at a high price, works for that small farm. Whereas if that was done on a bigger farm, the, the higher labor requirement, more labor units, all of a sudden that's not economical anymore. Whereas if you move somewhere to a larger scale, then mechanization becomes super important and something like quinoa is viable, whereas it's not viable on a small farm because, you know, it's you need to be mechanized to actually make that function. And so um, so whilst we're doing those, we are doing those supply chain studies, um, we, we started with the agronomic to get the ball rolling uh, in that, and now we can refine and probably chase the winners a little bit better, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I think matching up um, existing small markets, household, you know, the growth of vegetables sold on the side of the road, you understand there's a familiarity there. Um, and it's just, as Jason said, matching that to where those smaller communities might exist or if it's, it's broader scale and you can get harvesters in. Yeah. Thanks. I my question is actually very similar, so I, I use my current power to jump the line a bit. Sorry, Mike. Um, how did you come up with the actual crops that you were testing or that you tested in the in the field? I mean, you, you showed the requirements and kind of the the general um, yeah framework that they should 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 meet. But there's still probably still, I mean, dozens of options available. Did you? sit down and brainstorm or did you have like a, a process for that did you ask experts come to university yeah. what was the so process? so we so we had we had the literature we had you know what's possible from the literature we worked very closely and 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 it's my mistake i have not got that on my um my final slide there in terms of who's in the team but the the dad the the department of agricultural rural development we actually worked really strongly with the, the the field staff there to hear what they wanted what they are interested in or what their farmers are interested in and so so we like i guess quinoa we bought bought in as like that didn't come from vietnam as an idea but but um everything else is pretty much that the, the farmers were interested or the dad staff have seen it grown somewhere else and wondered is that possible um and so so yeah it was ground up a lot of the cases, but we had the literature there to sort of fill in. Well, this should work, and that should work. Or um, when we didn't want to, we didn't want to uh, reinvent the wheel. So if you know mm. if people have grown tomatoes, then fine. We already know you can do that. So, and and just a quick follow up: was the is it general generally crops that are grown in the Mekong Delta already? Because sometimes you also mention new crops. So what's the the mix between um, crops that Maybe not those farmers, but that were kind of common in the Mekong Delta and completely new ideas. Yeah, well, the beetroot's new and quinoa's new. So <laughs> yeah, so they're out there, our newbies. Um, but yeah, the the, the um, cow pea we were really keen to get a legume in the system. Soybean was uh, recommended uh, from Dard, and we with our sort of knowledge of the literature we tested soybean but knowing that it's only moderate salt tolerance and and consequently it failed so looking then they they're interested in the legume what can we find that fits that growing calendar and it's a, you know shorter duration was also a big requirement trying to get something that can get through its reproductive phases and avoid those abiotic stresses so cowpea was was great because it, it's a multi-purpose crop and finding crops that have um, beyond one benefit, whether it's because it's a legume or it could be used as a forage crop or it could be harvested as a bean, consumed as a vegetable, those mm. sorts of things became appealing. And then the farmers really got on board with that, which is great. Yeah. So it's sort of a, a yeah, you know, the suggestions are, are passed in and we try and optimize what crops might suit that and if it's um if there's longer term legacy effects as well through nitrogen fixation i mean what a win for the system okay so so it's a it's a mixed methods approach yeah <laughs> yeah call it okay Team great. Effort. <laughs> mike uh you've been very patient yeah thanks very much and thank you for a very interesting presentation 
My angle comes from the aquatic side, the, the fishy side, rather than crops, but of course recognising that the, the integrated systems, rice fish uh, and other crops fish, uh, is, are of course interesting for, for, for delta environments today. And on another 1CG uh, programme called ASEAN, we're looking at, among other things, uh, regenerative agriculture, which involves soil health. And uh, some time back, James Quilty, who you know from ACIR, asked me and others to evaluate a, a rice shrimp project, which I think you were also involved with. And that work promoted a Bayesian belief network uh, probability app. So my first question is, is that application still in use and are farmers finding it useful? Um, um, so I, I'm not I'm not sure on the um, the uptake of of the BBN app. I know they were they were interested. I know they wanted it. It was one of the things that we we need this. Um, but I'm not sure how far that got developed after that project ended. Um, but we had it set up. We got it to a point where we had the structure there. It functioned. But like any any decision support system, its its value improves with data going into it. And so. Um, I'm not sure how much has, has happened since the project ended. OK, thank you. And the next question, part of the question is, have you come across something called a biofunk tool? It measures soil health by gathering a range of um, soil properties to give a prediction about soil health. Uh, short answer, no. But one of the things that we've um, we work with the farmers because we initially started with training programs to train the farmers about salinity as a as a because it's such a high risk factor for, for cropping. Um, and what came out of that was actually they need just soil soil health training. And so um, it was amazing what the farmers could tell you about their soil um, just from their observations. Like we keep growing rice and the yields keep going down. We keep putting more fertilizer on, but the yields keep going down uh, but when we grow these alternative crops everything changes and the next you know the next rice crops better and and so they they put it together and realize that soil health is really important but they don't know much about it and so we have changed our training from salinity training to soil training soil constraint training and um and that's we've done it and you'll have to forgive us for just being australian people working with australian farmers and understanding what that's like uh, we've used the models that we know work with our farmers and took them to Vietnam and the Vietnamese team are like, oh, this isn't going to work. Like, no one's interested in this stuff. You won't get farmers engaged in this. And we have to, look, trust me, it works. Farmers love this stuff. And we did it and the farmers engaged and the, the dad people, oh, we've never seen farmers engage like this, you know. And so farmers are farmers. They they understand the soil. They understand, like, they want to know more about it. If they don't know, they want to learn. And so, so that was... Um, that I, I don't know the biofun tool i'm not familiar with it but anything that it links soil fertility or soil health to a farmer is is going to work i think yeah okay. as long as it's hands-on okay uh, two two quick extra questions the chameleon tool what's its lifespan uh good question it depends where and in what conditions it's being used the uh, creator of the chameleon is is called um, Richard Sturzaka. He's wonderful in he continues to develop the product and um, takes feedback uh, from from a whole world like range of developing countries that are utilizing the chameleon. Uh, he's had chameleon sensors last one cropping season. He's had them last five cropping seasons. So. It's it's finding what parameters affect those um, and why they would disintegrate quicker. He has work on extra durable sensors that are thicker, and he's working on coatings and different things like that to you know expand their um, longevity. Well, yeah, uh, we've got two years out of that. Yeah, that. but the the actual scent the the computer part of the sensor will you know will last for a very long time it's just the actual sensors that go in the ground that may need replacing and they're they're very cheap so one last question uh, 
have you looked at genetically modified crops for, for, um, for, for saline resistance? We haven't. No, and and there would be you would have to do a bit of work with finding policies um, and how that matches in the systems. Right. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. How, I how see much it. are these chameleon sensors, by the way? Can I ask roughly? Yeah. So the card, the chameleon card is about $50 Australian with that comes with three sensors already. And um, the Wi-Fi is, is $150, $200. But looking at, um, so they're actually produced in Africa, which is where Richard started a lot of his work in Tanzania and countries like that trying to um, solve water crisis issues there, which is there's some great work that he's doing and developed a factory um, there. So there's, they're working on trying to get them the, the price lower each time and more accessible for farmers. Yeah, the, so those cards are our go-to for the farmers because it's, it's, you know, economically viable for them. Yeah. yeah. I just see a question in the chat. Um, from Stefan, I think, about natural inoculum of the cowpea. There is no current available uh, viable inoculum that's commercial in, in the Delta, but we have found nodulation and we're doing work on identifying and, and um, looking at salt-tolerant rhizobium. So there's there's a space there which is exciting and, and it's great that the cowpea that we sowed had had um, nodules when we when we looked at them, which is which is great, a great sign. Thanks. There's also another question in the chat, and that's also a question I had regarding the salinity levels in the different uh, sites that you had. You mentioned four provinces, so it's it's probably a, it's it's a gradient because it's up up rather upstream to coast. Um, did you? I mean, target the crops to the different levels, and what would what's your how how did you do that, and what are the levels? That's me answer questions. Yep. So in Soktrang, the oh, they can get up to. So the Vietnamese use grams per liter. So um, the canal, the sluice gates will shut at four grams per liter of 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 the water, irrigation water. So that was the basis that we used in determining if a crop would be suitable, understanding that soil salinization over the, the you know course of the dry season, that can get a lot worse and solute potentials and things like that. So if, if a crop can't handle that, um, it's sort of out of the equation. But we were finding um, canal EC up to, I think there's been 14, 15 deci siemens recorded um, we've got data that sort of says eight and nine um, in in those areas of the peak dry season, and then um, that sort of trend follows slower in the lag with the soil. Yeah, and so and so using mulch and and irrigating, we can we can minimise the solute potential. Even though there's salt present, we can minimise the effect of the solute potential, so we can still get the plants to grow. Uh, without that mulch there, of course, you get the evaporation and salts concentrate and the soil potential will kill the plant. Um, but the other thing is our, because of the nature of the problem, uh, it's quite normal to grow these plants when there is no salinity, but the salinity comes as they grow. So it's the end of the, you know, it's like Brooke says, the reproductive phase, if you get the salinity, then that's the problem. And so the the duration of that that crop becomes really important because you can, with the right a short duration, you can miss the salinity risk. You can actually have your crop harvested before the salinity comes in. But where 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 we've done trials in the field, you know, we've we've got even though, like Brooke said, like they you'll shut the sluice gate at four grams per liter um, with evaporation, and then even irrigation followed by evaporation, you'll get higher salinities in the soil, and and they will harm the sensitive crops for sure. So that's in provinces where there are sluice gate protection. We've got other provinces where the sluice gates are so effective that you don't get salinity coming in, but you, you've, you've effectively got a trapped water source. And so water scarcity becomes an issue. So salinity 
uh, even though our project is was focused on salinity, is it's actually in some provinces, it's water scarcity is the problem. Yep. So these alternative mm -hmm. crops are still better than rice because it's a different risk profile, different water use. Uh, and so it's still much more sensible to grow an alternative crop than it is to try to grow rice in the, in the dry season when you've got a limited amount of fresh water available to you. Um, and then that, that's why the chameleons are so important because you, you optimise that water use efficiency so you're not wasting water and then there's more water to, to go around within those trapped and closed systems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe you can come in here, Ola Oak. Uh, yes, also. sure, go ahead. Yes, um, as I, I also would like to acknowledge uh, this very nice presentation, Brooke and Jason, as uh, what I really liked was that you ex always had explanations also. So you made it an, an overview and you had always examples, so that was really nice. And you also uh, showed us um, your own lessons you learned. So I'm really valuing this in your presentation. And I was quite triggered by one that one of you said that it's very important the principles of how to implement and adopt. And then I thought, um, yeah, is this something one should go further with? As it's, it's really this type of thinking of uh, what is needed, why we are doing this, uh, why not that, uh, coming to this point of, uh, Yes, uh, irrigation every day, that is uh, maybe common practice, but it's not a uh, best practice. Uh, and so this uh, working with, with people in this food system, uh, more looking into the principles of how doing things, so how thinking it through. So not coming up to solutions saying, OK, now uh, use uh, beetroot and then uh, so many days before or after TET, but uh, yeah, more go into this way of doing things yeah thank you yeah and it's interesting like and, and i'm limited i've only really worked in vietnam uh, as my international experience but the farmers there they'll see something work and just pick up and go with it and so uh, the willingness you know you go from literally going from hey um let's consider growing alternative crop instead of rice because rice is risky and then they see it and now well, let's grow two alternative crops and it's like whoa just calm down like maybe we just get one right first but they they're wanting to keep going faster and mm -hmm. faster and so um you know being there to be able to support that interest and that enthusiasm but also protect people from perhaps the risks that come with with changing so rapidly um, but so there's a balance there with dealing with the individual, the individuals, right? I think that's the key to it. Like you, you, you've got to tap into that enthusiasm mm -hmm. and, 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 uh, they're, they're, uh, it might be their age and stage and, and who's there to farm with them or what their goals are, um, become, become really important. And we, you, you talk about learning, we've, we've spoken about a little bit, there's so much learning involved in it, but, um, of course, but. Uh, when we when we see the farmers with we're around our field trial and their neighbours then want to get involved and they start expanding out, um, then you start. We have the it's it's uh, because if they're not going to grow that alternative crop and they want to grow rice, well now we've got a, a hydrology conflict, you know because some people want to have flooded fields next to something that needs to be drained, and so those issues become become important. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and maybe even other things like um, you have less rice, but you need uh, the rice as a, as a milk. Yeah. So and and if you use uh, the rice as a milk, what are you not doing with the rice that you may have done before? So then there are always uh, yeah a lot of things to uh, to be looked into. Whether with one that is very good, you are causing something else where maybe something is missing at the end. So that this is really these uh, discussions about trade-offs, what what we are mm -hmm. using and in what way. Yeah, yeah. In yes. Bangladesh, yeah. In, in one of the projects we've. Uh, quite interestingly, com so I had a profitability analysis combined with a risk analysis. And then you can also see, OK, some some cropping systems may have higher profit, but also have a higher risk. And that's that's, I mean, important to to balance. Yeah. Um, we are running out of time. I would like to still ask you uh, what's your what are your next steps? What's what's coming next? Are you going for a second phase? How long is the project running? What's your 
do you have a scaling strategy? What is next in your vision? Yeah, so we, we're roughly halfway through. Um, and like we, we started in the COVID period, so it was a pretty rough start. But um, luckily, the team at, at Kanto Uni um, did a, a lot of work, um, good work that got the project loaded off in the right direction early. So that was good. We're about halfway through. And so what we what we are looking at doing now is is our struggle, like Brooke said in her presentation, that that fitting timing into a cropping calendar is very crucial. And so we want to do more work around timing, timing of sowing and timing of these land management practices and preparation. Uh, and and I think um, we need to probably start factoring in some like modeling um you know, climatic conditions into that and, and and factoring that into the outcomes and sort of using our field trials to validate those models. Um, so we need to do that. We need to, at the moment, all of our fertility is based on what is common practice in the area, which is largely coming off what people do if they grow maize. Um, and so there's a fair bit of optimization to be had in that space. Um, but yes, moving forward, so this project ends in mid-2025. Um, and so we are looking at, at developing a new project that uh, still looks at uh, using alternative crops, developing further on what we've been doing, like Brooke says, focusing on legumes a little bit more. And of course, um, Vietnam, like every other country in the world, you know, um, soil carbon, greenhouse gas emissions have to be factored into that. And so, so um, looking at the benefits that our improved systems with these alternative crops that deliver benefits for the farmers, but also benefits for the system and quantifying some of those as well so that that can be used. So it's quantified, it's known that if farmers change to this practice, then these are the benefits um, that come from it, social as well as, you know, physical, you know. Very interesting. Thank you. I'm, I'm sure uh, you'll get that uh, work funded. Um, I also hope that we keep on uh, engaging and maybe even uh, try and formalize uh, a collaboration uh, in, in more detail uh, in the future. Um, for now, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very enjoyable. Mm. And the next Delta Talks, I'm not exactly sure if we have a date already. Uh, we have in about four weeks the International Rice Congress coming up and the whole world, of course, is uh, very busy with that and focuses on that. So I'm not sure if that is maybe in the way and we need to find an alternative date. We will announce that ASAP. Yes. So thank thanks you, everybody, yeah. for participating. Uh, uh, thanks for the opportunity. It's great you. to see you again, too. Thank you. OK. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Thank you.